Oh. So, um, yeah, it's the first time I've been here as a venue. It's very nice, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, I'm a change agent in the NHS, and I've, um, yeah, I spent 25 years um, uh, leading change in the NHS, and I've, um, I've never been a clinician, I've never been a manager. I've only done change. So, um, uh, my background is in social science, and um, I have a doctorate in social science, and... Um, you know, I'm just really interested in, in people and systems and what makes things tick and how we can change the world. So I've worked at a national level um, in improvement, um, uh, quality improvement, patient safety, um, large-scale change uh, since 1998. Um, I used to work at Leicester Royal Infirmary and um, uh, leading change. And then I got plucked from the obscurity of that hospital um, to be a Tony Blair waiting list buster. And I spent about four years just um, leading big um, waiting time reduction programmes across England. And uh, since then, I've you know, worked on um, lots and lots of big national initiatives. So I used to run the Cancer Improvement Programme, the Cancer Services Collaborative um, for England, um, uh, coronary heart disease. Um, uh, uh, one of the things I was really proud of was um, work that we did on um, people with dementia and um, antipsychotic drugs, um, unwarranted use. And, um, and we used a lot of um, ideas around community organising and social movement thinking. And um, in three years, we saw a 51% reduction in prescribing of um, antipsychotics for people with dementia. So, um, yeah, I've learned a lot about change, and, um, and it mostly means um, that the way that typically we go about big change programmes doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work very well, or it works to a certain extent, but it, you know, it's very hard, I think, to get the, um, uh, the goals that we want. So, like, the older I get and the wiser I get, the, the more radical I get. So, um, yeah, watch this space. So, I want to talk about um, being a change agent, and I want to talk about um, the change agent of the future and, like, where the world's going. And it's fantastic to have the opportunity, um, you know, to, um, to talk to um, a research and knowledge community because I just think the whole way that the world of change is going um, is one where um, you know, our, our worlds will um, increasingly connect and um, collide. And um, I actually think, you know, when people say to me, what do I think will be the two biggest roles for change agents in the future? I think um, number one is around curating knowledge, and number two is about making connections. Very different to what change agents in health and care um, typically do um, at the moment. So I was going to show you some of my predictions and why. So um, to start with, I just want to talk um, kind of quite broadly about what's happening in the, in the world of change. And, you know, um, I, um, uh, because of like, me and my team, we try and work at the kind of um, cutting edge of change and make lots of connections. You know, a lot of our work is digital, um, you know, very active with social media. And through that, you know, we get to connect with people that are practitioners and thinkers, uh, researchers, futurists, around what is happening in the world of change. And it's interesting because whoever we talk to from whatever sector, everybody's saying the same things and pointing to the same directions. So I just wanted to show you um, what I think is happening. And I'm talking about this here in the context of um, seismic shifts because... You know, the nature of change is, is changing profoundly. And actually, if we want to be change agents, if we want to do our bit to change the world, um, we have to keep up. So let's look at some of those themes. So the first one is that across the world, you know, across multiple sectors and industries, change is becoming more disruptive. So, you know, for those of us that work in health and care, you know, in the past, like, small-scale incremental change, we know, was enough. But... It just isn't going to be in the future. You know, it's getting bigger, it's getting bolder, and it's getting faster. And the way that we go about change is, is changing too. So um, this is a, a quote from um, one of the change leaders at IBM, and they say, you know, we rarely see two, three, or four-year change programmes anymore. Now it's, six, it's 30, 60, 90-day um, uh, projects. That's it's starting to happen in the NHS. If you look at the moment, it, currently, what's happening around um, the roles that people are having in improvement and the way that we're going about change programmes, um, this kind of, of thinking is where we're going. 
The second thing that's happening is the revolution that is created by digital connectivity. And, you know, when it comes to knowledge, oh, my goodness me, you know, we can connect with virtually anybody in the developed world 24 hours a day, seven days a week, very little cost, very little effort. And, um, you know, the knowledge that is available to us that even, you know, three or four years ago, um, you know, is, is just mind-blowing. And, and my world and my life as a change agent has changed utterly profoundly because of this. The third thing that we see is that work is getting increasingly complex, and that's certainly true for us in the health and care sector, but it's, it's also true in, in virtually every sector that I talk to. And, you know, part of the reason for this is because in the old world, where, you know, things were much more kind of stable and, um, and consistent, you know, the sort of jobs that we did were much more... Um, you know, repetitive and calm, and now everything's changing so quickly. Um, and there's one particular consequence of this, um, which is that hierarchical power is diminishing. Because the sort of jobs that we used to do, you know, meant that, you know, a nice hierarchical structure, everybody in their nice little box, you know, um, you know, it was fine when the world was stable. But in the world that we're in now, where relationships are changing all the time, we're connecting all over the place, and we need to move at, at, you know, very fast. You know, this, this idea of putting every, everybody in their job in their little box just doesn't work in the same way. And very often it means that people at the top of the um, system with the positional power, they pull the lever and nothing happens. You know? So um, we need some different ways. And then um, the final kind of um, theme that I wanted to talk about now is, is related to... Um, uh, what's happening to change, you know? Um, and what's happening is that um, change processes and change functions in organisations are moving right out to the edge. So if you look at, you know, manufacturing, you look at what's happening with Big Pharma, you know, the research and development functions that used to be right in the heart of the organisation are moving right out to the edge, okay? And um, it's happening in terms of organisational development. It's happening in terms of um, improvement. And the reason why is because in this very fast-moving world, having your change or improvement or R&D function right in the middle um, means that it's, um, it's shielded from what's happening in that fast-paced outside world. And it's just the wrong place for it to be. And in a sense, you know, we want, the, we want our innovators and our R&D people and our change leaders to be right out in, on the edge, like one foot in the organisation and one foot outside so that we're getting all these new ideas and perspectives and experiences and we're bringing them in. And um, I was going to show you an example now, and this example comes from the Cabinet Office. And if the Cabinet Office get this, oh my goodness, the rest of us need to. And, and what the Cabinet Office did is they, um, they set something up called the Policy Lab. And what... Why they did this is because they recognise that the whole policy-making process of government is so slow, and it's just not keeping up. So, um, so this is their diagram, you know. They, um, this is the work, okay, of, um, of government, of policymakers in government. And what we want to do is that we actually want to put our, our change-makers and, and the people that are coming up with the new ideas, we put them right on the edge of the organisation so that they can get these ideas and they can, uh, they can uh, pull them in. So, you know, as, um, as change agents, we need to be on the edge. And I really like this framework. I mean, there's lots of different ones. Um, um, this one here talks about um, old power and new power. And um, by the way, every, everything I talk about, um, there'll be a reference either on the slide or um, there's um, pages of references at the end because I knew as kind of researchers and knowledge leaders, you do like to have a nice reference or two. So, um, so um, everything's referenced. So... Um, yeah, this idea of old power and new power. So certainly in my world, you know, the one I live in in the NHS, it's a world that's very focused on, on old power. Okay, what do we mean by that? Um, old power is like a currency, you know, like money. And the thing about money is there's some people that have got a lot of it and other people, most people haven't got a lot of it. Okay, so it's kind of, it's held by a few. And this kind of power is, is um, owned by the people at the top of the organisation, you know, the people with positional authority, and they, they push it down. And people do things because they're commanded to do them, you know. Um, you have to do this because we have to hit, hit the four-hour wait target in, um, in the emergency department, 
or you know you have to do this because it's the quality standard um, from the from the commissioner. And because old power is about pulling the levers of authority in the organisation, it tends to be closed because you can only push those levers so far. And largely, okay, old power is about transactions. You know, um, we have to do this because it's the performance agreement. We have to do this because it's the contract. You know, it's, it's, um, it's those transactions were held to account by transactional mechanisms. So let's think about new power. Okay. New power is like a current, you know, it, it, it surges with energy and it's made by many people coming together with a common purpose. And again, it fits in with this idea around change from the edge because it, it's, um, this kind of power gets, gets pulled in, you know, and it's, uh, it's typically it's shared by, by many people together. It's a, it's a mobilising um, uh, mass power and new power, you know, tends to be open. OK, you know, it's like um, virtually anybody can come and join in and, um, and be part of this movement. And generally, new power is relational because, you know, the thing about old power is, um, you know, you have to do this. But the thing about new power is we want to do this. You know, it's like, um, uh, you know, we're, we're connecting and we're part of this because we want to be because it fits with our values and it fits with our purpose and it's based on relationships. Now, where we need to be, and I think where the change agent of the future needs to be, is in this very, very difficult zigzaggy place um, in the middle. You know, some of the people that I connect with are um, forecasting the imminent de demise of hierarchy, okay? Do you know, it ain't going to go in my lifetime. Um, I think that um, it is diminishing, but I think it's, gonna, it's gradual. And what I see in our world of health and care is um, old power is, um, is alive and kicking. And actually, um, what I see happening in many, many NHS organisations is because we have a lot of difficulties at the moment, you know, money is really tight, it's very hard to hit the quality standard, um, to hit the activity goals. Because leaders feel we've got to get a grip, you know, we've got to manage risk. Actually, we're hanging on even more tightly to our old power ways. And yet history tells us, you know, that this is what's coming. This is the way the world's going. I think so. I, but I think what, what I see in the NHS at the moment is um, new power is like um, a layer that kind of sits on the top. But we've got to be able to work with both. Now, um, this is some more um, research that, that really influences me. Uh, this is so interesting. Um, what we've got here are two Canadian researchers, Batalana and Caschiaro, and this was um, a research study that appeared in the Harvard Business Review, July and August 2013. Okay? And these two Canadian researchers went into a very big organisational system and they followed 68 uh, big change projects around this organisational system. And the reason they did it was they wanted to understand what makes an effective change agent. You know, who, who are the best change agents in organisations? So what do you think, um, or does anybody know, what was the name of the very big organisational system that these two Canadian researchers followed 68 change projects around in? Anybody know? And we read this paper, okay? It was the English National Health Service, okay? They followed 68 projects around the NHS. And, um, and it's, it's a really um, great article, really interesting. But I just pulled a couple of things out for us today. The first thing they found was actually being an effective change agent and having the power um, to lead change was actually very little to do with where you are in the hierarchy. Okay? It was much more to do with, um, with informal. So in a sense, being a change agent was much more about new power than old power, being an effective change agent, you know? Um, and it was the people that were in the, in the centre of the network and were able to organise and, um, and, and mobilise other people informally. Okay? The second thing that they, they found was, if you want to create change on a small scale, and small scale incremental change is, is a good thing, okay? it's just not enough, I don't think, then work through what they call a cohesive network. And what they mean by a cohesive network is being in a network with people like me. Okay? So we're a cohesive network today because we're all passionate about research, okay? This is very cohesive network. Um, but it's like, so in a cohesive network, um, change happens peer-to-peer. -peer. So it's like GP to GP. 
or um, emergency room nurse to emergency room nurse, or um, you know, accountant to accountant. Okay, but um, you know, I'm in a network with people like me, and that's great for small scale change. However, if we want to create big change, which is what most NHS organisations want to do, or what most uh, health and care systems want to do, then you've got to create what they call bridge networks between disconnected groups. And what they mean by that is, as a change agent, you need to be the person that connects people that are currently disconnected, okay, and actually brings people together. And what I see constantly across the NHS and the wider health and care system is lots of ambitious plans for big change, but the way that we're going about them is through peer-to-peer -peer and cohesive networks. And, um, yeah, interesting strategy. And um, this is interesting as well. This is um, this guy, um, Leandro Herrera. He, he writes about um, viral change and how you create it. And, um, and he's worked out a way, statistically, to, um, to count um, like, um, uh, influence levels. And what he, again, he's saying the same thing. People who are highly connected, you know, people that work with new power, have twice as much power to influence change as people with old power, positional power. Okay? And, you know, like, we live in a world often where we think, you know, oh, I'm only a staff nurse, or um, I'm only a trainee doctor, or I'm only a physiotherapist. But do you know what? Trainee doctors and physiotherapists and staff nurses can change the world. And, and I think, you know, we're, in a, we're moving into a world where increasingly, you know, this idea of, you know, I've got some key performance indicators for you and I'm going to hold you to account for, i.e. Um, old power, okay, just isn't going to be enough anymore. And actually, I think we have to be much nearer I have a dream, you know? Um, because if, you know, we, we, um, we have to be, we're moving to a world where people engage in change because they want to, not because they have to. Oh, and guess what? The evidence shows that if people get it, if there's a sense of uh, commitment to a different future and people understand the why and it's meaningful, it's a heck of a lot easier to do KPIs because KPIs... Um, you know, they mean something. They make sense to me. I understand the bigger picture. So, I think we're moving to a world where disruption is going to be the new normal. I mean, if you look at things like the five-year forward view from the NHS, you know, our blueprint, our vision for the next five years, um, and, um, and you're kind of like a sad person that counts words in it, like me, um, you know, what you'll see is that it mentions the word radical um, 10 times, it mentions transformation 12 times, and it mentions change 31 times. And it's a 28-page document, which is, like, quite a small policy document, OK? And, and in a sense, what the five-year forward view is saying is, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're up for really big radical change, you know? Our world's got to change. So, in a sense, it's, it's disruptive. It's not small-scale incremental. It's really big. And, um, and I really like this quote from Gary Hamill. Gary Hamill, according to the Financial Times, is the number one business influencer in the world. And he says, tomorrow's management systems will need to value diversity and dissent and divergence as highly as conformance, consensus and cohesion. And, you know, it's, it's, it's where we're going. And I just think, you know, bring it on. So... We need to be rebels, you know. We need to be the people who are challenging the status quo. Um, and I've got some ideas here from a guy called um, Peter Van. Um, um, and uh, he's one of my Twitter friends. And he talks, you know, what do we know about rebels? They're the people that are the principal champion, you know, of the, um, you know, the people that are leading a cause, leading a particular action. And the thing about rebels, they don't sit and wait for permission, you know, for somebody to say, yes, you're allowed to do that. They get on with it. You know, they lead, they innovate, they strategize. And the thing about rebels is that they're not like unguided Exocet missiles creating havoc in the organization. You know, they're responsible, they're value-driven. They're doing what they're doing because it's the right thing to do. And rebels can play really great roles in organizations. You know, they name things that other people don't see. They point to new possibilities and new horizons. And without, without rebels, the storyline never changes. And our health and care storyline has to change. So we need rebels. So, actually, you know, what we need are people who can rock the boat but actually manage to stay in it. You know, people who can walk that very fine line between being different and fitting in, inside and outside. You know, people that can operate at the edge. Edge walkers. Um, and, you know, who, can, who, who are able to challenge the status quo. It's interesting. If you look at um, some of the evidence base from people like um, Deborah Mayerson, what they talk about um, effective rebels can do is both conform and rebel. 
And, you know, um, my little team um, in, inside the National Improvement Body, um, NHS Improving Quality, like, we do all this, like, really edgy, um, radical stuff. And, and, like, we're constant rebels. But do you know what we've learned is that we have to be the best conformists in our organisation. So when it comes to, like, you know, getting our monthly re uh, performance report in on time, it's never late, it's always early. And when it comes to turning up at a meeting, we always turn up and we always turn up on time. When it comes to people in our wider organisation, we never, ever badmouth or speak badly of anybody else in our organisation, in another team. Whatever we think of them, we just don't do that, OK? Because we've learned that we have to be the best corporate citizens in order, in order to get the space to be the rebels, OK? And again, the thing about boat rockers, capable of working with other people to create success, not destructive troublemakers. So um, I'm going to show you a slide now that I think illustrates this really well. And it comes with a health warning because um, I've put labels on this and people hate the labels and I tried to change the labels to something else but the, other, the new labels are even worse. So like, look beyond the labels, okay, to the description. So what I'm doing here is I'm contrasting somebody who's a rebel with somebody who's a troublemaker, okay? So let's start off by looking at rebels. You know, rebels kind of create a new world. They create change. They are passionate about the person-centred or patient-centred mission of the organisation. They're optimistic about possibilities for change, and they generate energy in people around them. As a result, they attract other people, they attract resources, um, you know, um, they make good stuff happen, and they see possibilities, potential hope everywhere. And um, as we said previously, rebels are able to work together um, with other people to create change. That's different to being a troublemaker. A troublemaker, um, they complain and whinge a lot. But what they're complaining about is very me-focused, you know, like the injustice of my situation, how badly I'm being treated. And they're very angry um, about what's going on and, like, the injustice. Um, and they, they're pessimistic, you know. Um, every kind of change initiative or thing we're trying to do better, you know, nah, I tried that before, didn't work. And as a result, they um, sap the energy of other people and they alienate other people. So the positive rebel comes skipping along with a great improvement idea and all they can see is like 100 different problems in it. And as a result, other people will give them a wide berth and they're left alone. Now, just a couple of things about this. You know, um, like my whole career will tell you, very often when you're a rebel in an organisation, other people think you're a troublemaker, OK? Um, and, and it can be really hard. Um, the other thing I'd say is I know an awful lot of people, particularly clinical colleagues, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, who, who start off as rebels, you know, and... Um, uh, really positive people who you know, want to make a difference, but very often will find themselves in environments, um, in work situations that are very dysfunctional, highly toxic, and they go down that slippery slope to becoming troublemakers, and they kind of can't get back again. So um, we haven't got a lot of time, but I was just going to give you a couple of minutes, okay? So um, have, a, have a rebel and troublemaker talk on your table. I'll put the slide back in a moment, okay? What are your insights around rebels and troublemakers? Which one are you? And, you know, what moves people down that slippery slope from being a rebel to a troublemaker? And how do we stop people falling in? So let's go back. OK, have a couple of minutes. And I can see there's some very nice conversations going on, and I'm, I, feel, I feel bad to kind of disrupt them, but I know you've had a long day. OK, um, a question now. <laughs> Looking at this, this list of attributes of rebels, OK, there's one, like, word or term here that is, the, the evidence suggests is the most important one when it comes to staying a rebel and not going down the slippery slope and becoming a troublemaker, okay? Which of those, um, which of those attributes of a rebel is the most important when it comes to keeping somebody a rebel? I sh shall I show you? Together, okay? Number one rule of being a rebel, you can't be a rebel on your own. You know, because, um, you know, we work in organisations where the kind of the, you know, the tentacles of, like, normalisation and how we're meant to behave and what we're meant to do, um, you know, they're, they're, they're just too much for any one person to deal with on their own. 
and we have to find other people to link up with, um, you know, to connect with and to make change happen with. You know, we can be the most innovative, fantastic, creative person on our, uh, in the world, but unless we can connect with other people, it, it ain't going to happen. So, you see, um, again, let's think about this in the context of old power and new power. You know, um, you know we're living in a world that is increasingly open and increasingly social. So the way that we typically... Um, would, would do um, change projects, improvement projects, patient safety projects in, in an old power world is, you know, um, our, uh, you know we're above the waterline here. So we'll form a project team, we'll put all the mechanisms in place to coordinate it, we'll take action. But actually, increasingly as a change agent, we need to be at this place below the waterline as well. You know, making ourselves visible and connecting, sharing um, what we know and think, um, you know, finding people um, to connect with and mobilise, you know, communicating and having conversations as a, as a way of, um, of sharing knowledge. And the thing about, you know, this below the waterline, it's all based on trust. So, you know, when we talk about new power and we talk about it's relational, you know, um, it's, um, it's, you know, above the waterline, we can kind of like, you know, get people to do stuff because it's your job and you have to do it. But, you know, it's all based on relationships and it's all based on trust and it's very easy to lose it, I think. Um, another thing that I think is really important in this world of, um, you know, this com in increasingly open and social world where um, new power is becoming more prominent, you know, is to think about how, what our change projects look like. I'd say far too many change processes in the NHS look like cathedrals. And um, here's one. You know, it's like we build these like massive structures for change, and these are all the work streams. Um, this is a fantastic um, blog, actually, written by um, Steve Sewell. And he's one of the leaders of the, the Vanguard programs for new care models. And it's called Stop Training Our Project Managers to Be Process Junkies. And, um, and, and you know, he's right that we've, we're kind of like we're setting up in you know, a program management office for change and bringing in all these PMO people. And what we end up doing is we get judged on our ability to like tick a box, you know, to achieve a task by a certain time. And it's not based on um, and it's not based on outcomes. And, and again, it's actually a very old power way to do things because actually we want to take out the risk and we want to make sure we're managing it and we're holding people to account. And I'd say that increasingly. Okay, our change processes need, in, a, in a new power world need to be more like bazaars where we're connecting and we're sharing. I think there's a very nice bazaar going on here today and tomorrow. Um, so, you know, in that context, what do I think are the biggest opportunities for change agents in our system and where do we need to um, be moving? And as I said, I think it's, you know, being these bridge builders between disconnected groups, you know, finding people, um, uh, connecting with them, you know, the stuff under the waterline and being curators and sharers of knowledge. Um, and I also think that, um, in, you know, too many of our improvement teams um, in the NHS have become like bench scientists, you know, in a sense that they're managing, um, you know, that they're, they're, they're managing programmes. And actually, we need to become knowledge leaders and we need to be connectors. You might have seen this before. Let's talk about um, curating knowledge. You know, um, this very famous quote from Mitchell Kapoor, and he says, getting information off the internet is like taking a drink from a fire hydrant. You know, like you go on Google and, um, and you, you Google fractured neck of femur. You know, how many, um, how many links will there be? Like three million? So how do you know what's good information um, and, um, and what isn't? And, you know, there's even a new um, disease that's been identified as a result of this. Um, it's called um, cyberchondria. And it's the unfounded anxiety concerning the state of one's health brought on by visiting health and medical websites. And it's so true, you know, because you start looking stuff up, don't you? And then you think, oh, no, I've got this, I've got that, you know, because you, can't, you just can't discern it, you know? Um, so when we think about this, you know, in a, new, in, in, in a world that's increasingly social and open, what's the best way to spread new knowledge, okay? Um, uh, what this guy who knows quite a lot called, um, called um, Nick Milton, who's a kind of big big cheese in the knowledge world, he says, social connection and discussion, okay, the kind of tacit knowledge where, where people with similar interests actually share things, is 14 times more effective than the written world word, best practice databases and toolkits. And, and you know, I, I show you this slide as somebody who has spent 25 years as a change leader 
Um, and most of the change programmes I've worked on are focused on toolkits. You know, last year, um, the Health Foundation did a study. Um, it was a literature review around um, the, the, the best and least effective ways of, um, of spreading new knowledge. And they said, a new improvement knowledge, and they said um, toolkits is like, like the worst. You know, because you can put everything in a toolkit, but then nothing happens. So, you know, we've got to be finding ways um, for, for people to connect. And I'm just going to show you something in the, in the wider world that I think is interesting. You know, connections, you know, that way that we can connect with other people, you know, both virtually and face-to-face, -face, is actually becoming the new documentation. And I'll give an example of this, okay? If you're a computer programmer, you just don't bother reading the, um, the guidance manual that comes with new software, Okay. What you do, you go onto this um, platform, it's called Stack Overflow, and you just um, put your questions in and everybody else answers them for you. you know? And that's the kind of the way that the world's going, you know, social connection. And um, just show you a couple of, um, uh, some of the ways that we're working um, like this. Um, uh, this is The Edge, and um, this is something my team set up last November. And basically, it's, um, it's a, a knowledge hub for um, anybody that's interested in transformational leadership and being a change activist and methods um, uh, for change. And we, we put this out um, about every three weeks. You know, we, we look all over the world and we, we find, like, really interesting stuff for our community and we put it out. But it isn't just, like, a one-way thing of putting information out. It's actually a, um, a way for people to connect with each other, um, you know, um, to make connections, to find out what's going on. Um, and then the other thing we do is... Um, once a month, we have the Edge Talks, and, um, and these are fantastic, and they're like a free, um, a free web seminar. So our next one is on the 2nd of October, and, um, and it's um, led by these two um, women called Lois Kelly and um, Carmen Medina. They are, they're from the US, and um, Carmen Medina used to be a spy. Um, and, um, and, she was a, uh, and they wrote this book called Rebels at Work, a handbook for leading change from within. It's really, it's, 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 uh, it's really fantastic. And then um, we're going to run this thing on the 27th and 28th of January next year called a Transformathon. And we're going to run that through the edge. And basically it's 24 hours where we're going to have all sorts of virtual connections of people from all over the world um, helping the NHS with its transformation effort. And, you know, in that virtual um, 24 hours, um, um, our goal is to connect 100,000 people in, in that 24 hours. And there's going to be all sorts of practical things going on. Um, we're going to be running hackathons, which is getting people virtual problem solving with teams all over the world. Um, and um, uh, we've got, um, who have we got? John Cotter um, is, um, is doing it for free and Gary Hamill's doing it for free and everybody's doing it for free um, but it's, you know, it's like it's this whole thing around you know, curating knowledge and um, making sense of knowledge and you know, um, letting people connect around knowledge and bridging, uh, bridging the gaps between people that are um, disconnected so um, I hope this like, maybe inspired you a little bit and um, um, if you're interested in the Edge or the Transformathon, um, I've left you some postcards. So um, if you just put your email in there in a way that I can translate it, um, I'll, I'll sign you up for the Edge. It's free. And um, the other thing is that we won't give your email address to, like, John Lewis or, or <laughs> spam you. Um, and um, so, um, yeah, follow us on Twitter because we love to tweet. Subscribe to the Edge, which you can do through that. Um, we run a school, um, and you know, um, a lot of these materials come from our school called the School for Health and Care Radicals. Um, it's, a, it's a virtual school, um, and um, 7,000 people have been through this already. We're going to run it again in, um, in February. We've just had it evaluated by the Chartered Institute for Personnel and Development. And, um, and one of the things I'm really proud about um, with our virtual school is that um, they've evaluated it for impact, um, both um, individual um, measures of impact and organisational measures of impact and it's got a statistically significant um, positive score on every measure of impact both at an individual level and at an organisational level and the, the CIPD said so they've never seen a learning programme that has evaluated on every measure like that and um, sign up for our Edge Talks and then I've got lots of nice references <laughs> so um, yeah I hope that's inspired you and um, uh, I think this is like a fantastic um, uh, community here. And, um, uh, and I think the people here have got a really, really important role to play in, um, in changing the world. So, um, yeah, bring it on. Thank you.